So now that we know a little bit about the fact that Android is designed in a layered manner, let's talk about some of the layers that are involved here. And uh, one of the really cool things about Android, as you'll discover as we go through this, is pretty much every topic you learn about in computer science and computer engineering, for that matter, shows up somewhere along the way in one or more of these layers, right? So we're going to talk first about the hardware components, which is kind of the electrical engineering or computer engineering part of our curriculum. And we'll see a little bit about that. Um, we're going to talk about some of the operating system stuff. So how many people here have taken CS281, the OS course? OK, so about maybe a little bit over half. Um, so some of this stuff will be review, although you may or may not have talked about some of these things because some of this stuff isn't in Linux, as we'll see. And then we'll talk about a bunch of other, other things that you're unlikely to have stumbled upon unless you did a lot of Android programming. So let's start first by talking about the hardware stuff, and then we're going to talk about some of the kernel facilities. And the main purpose of the Android Linux kernel is to extend GNU Linux with a bunch of things that make it kind of customized for the smartphone and tablet environment. And we'll see that there's a couple of things that are needed to make that work. So let's talk a little bit about hardware. So obviously, uh, if you haven't noticed, which I'm sure you have noticed, the devices we cart around with ourselves as our so-called life companions have a whole bunch of things in them related to, to sensors and memory and processing and storage and so on and so forth. So one thing we have, of course, are, are sensors. And more and more sensors get built into your device for all kinds of reasons. And you can also then leverage your connectivity capabilities like Bluetooth and so on in order to add even, even other sensors in the vicinity that can interact with your device. So for example, for someone who might have, say, type 1 diabetes, you might have a blood glucose monitor, which can communicate wirelessly or in, by a Bluetooth or whatnot with your Android phone in order to be able to keep track of your, your levels. That's a pretty common thing to do these days. So that's using your phone as a mothership to communicate with things that aren't actually physically on the device. So here, just a, a sampling of some of the many sensors that are there. There's motion sensors that measure acceleration, forces, and rotation. And so obviously, things like accelerometers are useful for that. Gyroscopes. Why would someone use a gyroscope? What would, what would that be used for, potentially, on a mobile device? Right, but, but what would you use it for? Gaming, right. So you could use it as a game controller. Um, accelerometers come in all kinds of, you know, come in for all kinds of useful purposes. A couple years ago, one of my students who graduated 2009 timeframe, he actually developed something called RecWatch, which was a tool that was used to provide OnStar-like capabilities via an Android smartphone, where it would be able to measure rapid deceleration in order to be able to detect traffic accidents. So if your phone is going along at 60 miles an hour and suddenly it stops, it's probably because you had an accident, right? Um, or braked hard or something like that. So he was able to use an accelerometer, the accelerometer feature to detect that. There's a lot more to that story than we have time to talk about. But it's an example of how an accelerometer could be used for interesting things. There's also various environmental sensors that measure stuff like temperature, pressure, humidity, so thermometers and barometers, you can build those things into devices. Obviously, not every device has that, but you can add those. Um, position sensors that measure the physical position. So a magnometer would be another example. And these are all the various things that you could attach. So those are sensors. Then there's also the transceivers. We use these all the time, too. This is what connects us to the outside world, which is really what makes a phone more useful than just a laptop, right? Because it's, it's used for phone calls and things like that. So we have Wi-Fi, wireless networking. We have Bluetooth, which you can use to kind of have your personal area network. That would be something where you're talking from your, your mobile device to your blood glucose monitor or whatnot, or, or whatever you need to do to communicate over a short, you know, maybe 10 feet or so. Something called near-field communication. You may or may not remember back three or four years ago, they were advertising this thing they called the bump where you could bump your Android device with another device, and it would transfer files at that point and so on. It's actually kind of silly, but um, nowadays we could use this for other types of things like you know, Google, Google Pay or Google Wallet or something like that. And this is basically very close communication where you have the devices in physical proximity to each other by just a couple of inches. So NFC or near-field near communication, 
Those are other ways of communicating information. Um, and, and of course, you also have the, the phone itself <laughs> doing all this kind of stuff. Storage, so this is obviously used to keep track of stuff that you need for processing or persistence. So there's so-called random access memory. We'll talk about that in more detail shortly. That's if you want to be able to you know, read and write data, which may or may not live if the device gets shut down. There's flash memory, which is so-called non-volatile memory that can be electronically erased and reprogrammed. That's typically what we use on mobile devices now to store you know, your apps and your um, persistent data that you might want to keep, you know, profile information, your files, and so on and so forth. Of course, the processors, which do the computation. And uh, we were talking about CPUs. Bruce brought up the big CPUs, little CPUs, or was big and small, was that it? Big dot little, yeah. And uh, so CPUs do the basic processing. This, this should be like computer system organization thing you know. More and more of these things are multi-core. Uh, we're also getting GPUs put onto mobile devices that are more efficient for certain kinds of processing, especially graphics processing, or things that can be made to work like graphics processing. And then DSPs, which is really what you're doing for your, your radio that's communicating under the hood. So uh, that's going to be managing the analog to digital conversions and so on and so forth. So those, of course, are more hardware things. This is obviously sort of below the level at which we are concerned in our computer science courses by and large. If this was a computer engineering course, we'd spend a lot of time on these things. But the cool part of this is that there's a big ecosystem out there, people building these devices, sensors, transceivers, processors, memory, and so on. And then they can sell them in the context of the Android platform. And that's always the value of having a platform, right? You can get a multi-sided market where different people come to the table and they compete to innovate. And the winners, of course, are the consumers like us. OK, next topic, the Android Linux kernel. So essentially, this is a variant of the GNU Linux operating system kernel. So there's, there's the uh, little tux icon from Linux encased in a green bubble. So he's an Android. Talks. And uh, interestingly enough, the Linux kernel is written in C, of course, uh, just and the Android Linux kernel is also, uh, and it ships separately from the rest of the Android stack. And there's a whole variety of reasons why that's the case. Um, the primary one is they wanted to be able to very radically differentiate the source code licensing model for GNU from the other stuff. Yes, Malcolm. Yeah, so if you go to uh, you know, source.android.com, this link here, you'll find access to a Git repository or Git repositories where you can check out Android, everything from above the kernel up to the apps. So there's, a, there's one Git repository or one family of Git repositories that store the Android source code that's everything that's not the kernel. If you go to this link and you poke around, you'll find that there's instructions for downloading the Linux, the Android Linux kernel. And that is not housed in the same Git repository as the rest of the stuff. And, and there's a variety of reasons for that, mostly having to do with legal issues and licensing issues, but they're in two separate places. They are not bundled together. And they, they evolve at different rates, and there's different groups of people who work on them, and so on and so forth. So that, that's the main reason. Good question, though. Um, so what makes Android Linux different from you know, standard Linux, or classic Linux, or GNU Linux? I guess GNU Linux is the best thing to call it. Uh, and the main thing is that Android Linux has been optimized for the needs of mobile devices and apps, whereas GNU Linux has not, which is not to say that they couldn't merge them. I'll talk more about that in a second. But for now, and probably for the foreseeable future, there are two separate code bases that co-evolve with different groups of people with different intents and different purposes. So, so one of the things that goes on in the kernel are a bunch of optimized modules, that's what they're called, they're sort of driver-like things, kernel driver-like things, that are, that are really intended for the world of mobile devices. So here are some examples, right? So power management on a mobile device is to some extent different from power management on 
a desktop or a server or a laptop because they're different constraints. You're probably, you're almost guaranteed to be running your servers plugged into the wall. Your laptops plugged in a lot of the time. Your mobile phones probably plugged in very little, right? So power management is done in a very different way. Um, there's also other kinds of things. There's special ways in which Android wants to communicate between different parts of uh, the system using so-called binder, interprocess communication, and that's a very special feature that's Android-centric and is not what you're going to find in vanilla Linux. And then there's all a bunch of other stuff, too, about you know, touchscreen drivers and other types of things, and we'll talk about some of those, but they're different from what you get in standard, in standard Linux, GNU Linux. The other purpose of the Android kernel, which, by the way, is the same purpose as any kernel, is to try to shield the higher layers of the system, which in this case is Android, from the underlying hardware components and the diversity therein. So we'll talk a bit more about kernels a little bit later, but in a nutshell, the kernel does several things, but one of it is to try to shield you from variation in hardware. And that's a really important thing for it to do. And, and the reason it does that is you and I don't want to have to deal with this stuff, right? We don't have to want to think, oh, am I running on a, an ARM chip? Or am I running on an Intel chip? Or am I running on an AMD chip? Or am I running on a PowerPC chip? Or whatever other chips happen to be in vogue. The operating system kernel is the layer, or part of the kernel is the layer that shields you from all those details. And so you can write at a higher level and not have to worry about that stuff. By the way, does anybody know what these shields are? You know, like in, in classic uh, England, your coat of arms, your heraldry has a certain decoration and they, they mean something. Does anybody know what these are? Well, this is Paul McCartney's uh, coat of arms. And these are the coats of arms of, uh, I think this is the White Tree of Gondor from uh, Lord of the Rings. So you have to be a real super Tolkien geek to know this, but that's what those are. Um, and the other thing that the uh, kernel does, and we'll talk a bit more about this later because this is really important, and hopefully you've got a taste of this in, in 281, but I'll, I'll just refresh you and deepen your understanding. The kernel also mediates access to and the sharing of the underlying hardware resources. So there's an awful lot of things that there's a one or a handful of, right, like the processor or the cores or the network or whatever, and lots of apps may want to access those resources. And so one of the things the kernel has to do is kind of multiplex and timeshare, if you will, the access of all these things at the top of the stack to the relatively small number of things down there so that they don't end up getting corrupted or things get used in a way where it's confusing or someone thinks they have access to it, but it disappears out from under them halfway through it. So that's kind of classic operating system kernel stuff. And then the other thing that uh, Android does is it extends GNU Linux. So it has some really cool memory conservation capabilities that deal with the fact that historically, at least, smartphones didn't have a lot of memory. Nowadays, I think my I think my, my smartphone has lots and lots of memory now. I forget exactly how much, but it's, it's a lot. And uh, back in the day, though, it used to be, you know, several hundred K or something like that. It was probably not that much different from uh, programming MS-DOS, you know, back in the day, in the early releases. But nowadays, there's lots and lots of memory. But it still works slightly differently than the memory is more expensive. I'll talk about this in detail later and show you some stats about how much memory you have and what it costs and so on. But to keep the price points in a reasonable level, there's less memory on a mobile device. So there's ways of sharing it efficiently that you wouldn't necessarily have to worry about if you're programming a desktop or a server. Uh, another thing is managing power. I mentioned that already. That's a big deal on a mobile device because battery life is very important. Lots of things are done in the name of trying to save power. And then accelerate communication. That's another thing that's very important. And that has to do with the security architecture of Android and the way things talk back and forth which actually use Linux processes as the container, using that word loosely, in which your apps run. So if you remember anything from the operating system, of course, you took about processes. That still applies here to a large extent. Um, 
There's an effort called the Android Mainlining Project, which I don't think is very active at the moment. There was an intent maybe five years ago or so to try to merge Android back with vanilla Linux, and that's largely dormant for a variety of reasons, uh, not the least of which is the people who do Linux are like uh, Linus Torvalds and his, his army of uh, helpers. They are very picky about what they're going to let back in, and some of the design choices the Android folks made are contrary to what they're trying to do with Linux for a variety of reasons. So I'm not holding my breath that these things will ever converge at this point. But if you read this link, you'll at least see people gave it a shot a while back. I think it's just too far gone at this point to ever converge, but that's just me. Uh, other things are very centric to Android. Peyton. Yeah. But so obviously, like. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, great question. So Android is, is a fork of Linux, and that's kind of the point here. Um, it's a fork that will probably never join, right? So if you think about fork join, um, slightly different use of the fork join than we've been talking about up to this point. It's a, it's a fork that went off, and they probably take bits and pieces of things from later releases of GNU Linux and retrofit them back in, um, but it's, it's definitely its own beast at this stage. And then other people have taken it and gone even further. So for example, Qualcomm has something called Project Aurora, which takes Android Linux and then customizes it for Qualcomm chips, right? So, so it's just fork upon fork. And you can imagine, I think implied in your question, these things are rather vast. And so um, once you diverge past a certain point, you're never gonna get back to there. Okay, so let's wrap up here. The, the bottom line is it's a fork version. They're not the same. Uh, this is answering your question, what a fork is. And um, it's not entirely compatible. But if you know Linux and you look at Android, especially as a programmer of the APIs, not the internals, it's going to look pretty familiar. Anybody who's a Curb Your Enthusiasm fan would be pretty, pretty, pretty familiar. Right? So it'll look, it'll look similar, but it's not identical. All right, so that's the end, and let's